I'm Nima Rajan. Quebec Premier François Legault is introducing fines for those who refuse COVID-19 vaccinations. Premier Legault says adult residents without a medical exemption who refuse to get vaccinated against COVID will be charged a financial penalty. He says the penalty amount has not been decided, but it will be, quote, significant. He says about 10 percent of adults have not had their vaccinations, but they represent about 50 percent of intensive care patients. Well, meanwhile, the latest poll by Liget and the Association of Canadian Studies indicates support for lockdowns is falling as pandemic fatigue rises. Only 56 percent of respondents agree that governments are making the right decisions to limit the spread of Omicron and keep the health system from being overrun. 62 percent are satisfied with the federal government's pandemic response, which is down 5 percent from the beginning of December, while provincial governments are also seeing a 5 percent decline. This comes as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says Canada will have enough COVID-19 vaccines for all those eligible to receive a fourth dose if needed. A statement issued following his virtual meeting with provincial and territorial leaders yesterday says the government has secured enough vaccine doses for everyone eligible to get a fourth dose if needed. The federal government has said provinces and territories will receive a combined 140 million rapid tests this month although the statement did not provide any new details on when the deliveries will be scheduled. Canada's rampant spread of the Omicron variant of coronavirus has prompted some alarm in the United States. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control has issued a fresh Level 4 avoid travel advisory for Canada, citing a, quote, very high level of COVID-19. The State Department then almost immediately revised its travel advisory, which had been at a level three reconsider travel. It was quickly upgraded to its level four advisory that reads, do not travel to Canada due to COVID-19. Canada's decision to pursue a foreign investment protection agreement with Taiwan is being greeted with widespread approval in trade and diplomatic circles. International Trade Minister Mary Ng announced Canada's intention in a statement released by her office on Monday. Taiwan is self-governing, but the Chinese government claims it as part of China and has raised the threat of possible annexation by staging military maneuvers near the island and buzzing it with warplanes. The House of Commons Ethics Committee is expected to hold an emergency meeting this week. It is to investigate the public health agency's decision to collect data from millions of mobile phones. The data is meant to better understand travel patterns during the COVID pandemic, and there's word the agency is seeking to extend the collection for another year. Conservative and Bloc Québécois MPs are concerned about the privacy implications of tracking Canadians without their knowledge. The Public Health Agency of Canada, though, says it consulted with the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. The Grand Chief of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs is opposing a call by a new Democrat MP. It was for the military to support northern Manitoba First Nations amid a COVID-19 surge. Arlen Dumas says First Nations don't need the military to come and give them a band-aid, adding that what they actually want is long-term investment that will allow them to protect themselves. Northern Manitoba MP Nikki Ashton says she wouldn't have called for federal support without hearing from First Nation members first. She says most First Nation leaders are telling her that they are overwhelmed. The Consumers Coalition of Alberta wants the utilities regulator to release all information about one of Alberta's main power providers. It also wants to be involved in any talks involving alleged illegal behavior by ATCO. That includes an internal investigation into how ATCO Electric deliberately overpaid a BC First Nation by millions to secure contracts for another ATCO company. It then tried to pass the overpayment on to Alberta consumers. ATCO has acknowledged it made mistakes and has offered a $16 million settlement. Well, a week after shivering through minus 20 temperatures and then a snowstorm, another atmospheric river of rain is heading for BC's south coast. Environment Canada says heavy rain is on the way this morning through to tomorrow night, and residents are urged to protect their homes from potential floods. Between 50 and 150 millimeters will combine with melting snow to cause damage. Snow at higher elevations is expected to hit the south central and northern coasts, Haida Gwaii and northern Vancouver Island. 
Well, it looks like this week it's much of eastern Canada that's dealing with bitter cold weather. Environment Canada issued extreme cold warnings on Tuesday in northeastern Ontario, most of southern Ontario, and into Quebec. All right, we'll be back after the break with a look at a proposed surtax on houses worth over a million dollars and how one report says that will improve affordability. We'll have an interview with Dr. Paul Kershaw, the founder of Generation Squeeze, up next. The National Housing Strategy has released a new report produced through its Solutions Labs program. It recommends a progressive surtax on homes valued at over a million dollars as a strategy to cool the housing market. Generation Squeeze founder Paul Kershaw, who authored the report with input from 80 experts, says an annual tax between 0.2 and 1 percent could play a key role in reducing housing inequality. The federal government says it won't introduce a tax on the equity of primary residences in Canada, but is tackling skyrocketing housing prices in other ways. Well, joining us now to talk more on this is Dr. Paul Kershaw himself. Sir, welcome to Forum Daily. Thanks for having me. Now, so let's start with a, a quick overview of the current state of Canada's housing market, sir. Well, if you think back to when my mom started in the housing market in the mid-1970s, it took the typical young adult five years of full-time work to save a 20% down payment on an average-priced home in this country, whether you're in Vancouver, GTA, or pretty much anywhere across the country. But if you flash forward to today, it now takes over 14 years of full-time work for that typical young person to save a 20% down payment on an average price home across Canada. It's more like 18 in Ontario, 20 in BC. I think it's 24 in the GTA now and 28 or so years in Metro Vancouver. So you have to start saving in childcare. Um, and that's hard to do because childcare is often expensive. And what we're saying is, look, if we really want to restore affordability for all, we need home prices to stall so that earnings can catch up. And we're hoping we can get more and more Canadians agreeing with that logic. And then we can use every toolbox in our policy toolbox to try and uh, achieve that goal going forward. And we're proposing something we know is controversial, a tax on home value over a million bucks to help contribute to that end. All right, sir. So tell us a little bit more about this uh, proposed surtax and how it could help the situation. Well, whether you're worried about reducing housing unaffordability or wealth inequality, we're saying it's time to protect real shelters much more so than tax shelters. And your listeners might be wondering, what do you mean by a tax shelter? So for anyone who went to work today, 100% of their earnings is going to be subject to tax. If people use some of those earnings to invest in the stock market, 50% of their return on investment from the stock market would be subject to tax. But for anyone who's a homeowner like me, who has their wealth in their homes go up, barely any of that wealth is ever subject to tax. And the moment our policies turn our housing system into a strategy by which people can think, hey, I can get a really good return on investment that I shelter from taxation, we entangle everyday Canadians to bank on high and rising home, uh, home prices for their wealth accumulation strategies. And that inclines us to be happy and hopeful that home prices will continue to rise and leave earnings behind. But by definition, we then bake in unaffordability for those who follow in our footsteps. And so this tax is trying to disrupt that way in which we entangle Canadians in hoping home prices will continue to rise and rise above a million bucks. All right, so how long would it take for the housing market to cool down if this surtax were to be implemented? Well, the surtax in and of itself is unlikely to be a panacea, but so long as we tolerate this home ownership tax shelter, which is kind of, in many respects, akin to an offshore tax shelter. You know, when we have an offshore tax shelter, people move their money offshore to preserve assets. If we have a tax policy encouraging people to move their assets into wealth accumulation via housing, then we make housing a commodity and not just a place to call home. So we know that there would be a dampening influence right away. We'd have to see about how strong a price signal uh, the tax would be, but the revenue we would raise would create about $5 billion a year that we could then invest in deeply affordable cooperative housing and purpose-built rental housing, which is increasingly what is in reach uh, for young, hardworking, talented, well-educated people in our cities across the country. All right, Dr. Kershaw, just about a minute left here. But another thing to consider is that the average national home price is just a bit over $720,000. So what about Canadians who can't afford homes under a million dollars? 
Brilliant. And our our policy will have a kind of a downward slowing pressure on home prices generally. So hopefully it would kind of cool down the market, you know, even below a million bucks. But your point more generally is 90 percent of Canadians are not going to be subject to what we're proposing. They wouldn't pay a penny more. We're actually effectively asking the 10 percent of Canadians who live in the most affluent households in the country to show a kind of allegiance to the Canadian dream that a good home should be in reach for whatever someone can earn from hard work, whether in rental or co-op or maybe even in home ownership. And right now, the fact that we have this home ownership tax shelter that we protect and protect and protect, it is actually causing many others to be left on the outside looking in. And so we're wanting to say, let's show more allegiance to accessing real shelters than tax shelters. All right, Dr. Kersha, thank you again for joining us today on Forum Daily. You're welcome. Have a great evening. All right, we'll be back after the break with more stories from across Canada. Ontario says PCR tests in schools will be limited. Nova Scotia warns of crypto trading platform CoinRise, and Nike sues Lululemon for patent infringement. We'll have these stories and more of it like them when we return from break, so stay with us. We'll be right back after a short break. New school guidance has been released by the Ontario government. It says that only certain students and teachers who show symptoms of COVID-19 will have access to PCR tests when schools reopen to in-person learning next week. The Ministry of Health document says PCR kits will not be provided to entire cohorts or school populations. The document says those waiting for the result of a COVID-19 test or who cannot access a test must isolate at home, regardless of vaccination status, along with others in their household. The new guidance comes as Premier Doug Ford's office says Ontario students will return to school classrooms on January 17th. The Nova Scotia Securities Commission is warning the public about a crypto trading platform that is not registered in the province. It says CoinRise, which claims to be Canada's fastest growing crypto trading platform, is also the subject of an investor alert in Saskatchewan. The commission says at least one Nova Scotia investor's account showed substantial gains on the principal investment, although the investor was able to withdraw only a minimal amount of the reported returns, and further withdrawal requests were ignored by CoinRise. It says the investor was required to provide personal information which risked financial loss and identity theft. Nike is suing Vancouver-based Lululemon Athletica for patent infringement. It claims Lululemon's mirror electronic device for streaming workout classes and its mobile apps violate Nike patents, protecting decades of digital sport innovations. Last year, Lululemon filed suit against Peloton, accusing it of selling knockoff bras and pants. Rogers Communications has appointed Tony Staffieri, permanent president and chief executive officer, effective immediately. Mr. Staffieri has been interim CEO since November 16th. This was when Rogers says its board of directors began an executive search. A former chief financial officer, Mr. Staffieri, replaces Joe Natale. Mr. Natale left the company in November amid a family squabble between Rogers and his mother and two sisters, who are also board members. Alberta's chief medical officer of health says the province likely has 10 times or more COVID-19 cases that are being diagnosed through PCR tests. Dr. Dina Hinshaw told a news conference yesterday that it's very clear that with the current 40% positivity rate, transmission is higher than it's ever been before. She says given the number of cases, Alberta needs to prepare for a significant impact to the health system. There are 635 people in hospital with COVID-19, and 72 of them are in intensive care. Montreal police say a man experiencing homelessness has died after spending the night outside in extreme cold. Police say they responded to a call about a case of possible hypothermia on Monday night at an encampment in the city's West End. The 74-year-old man police found was taken to hospital where he was pronounced dead. Environment Canada says temperatures in Montreal hovered around minus 20 Celsius Monday night. Quebec's public health director called on shelters to disregard pandemic-related capacity limits and fully reopen to people experiencing homelessness. A senior Nova Scotia ER doctor says the pressures are being felt in ERs and are unprecedented in his career as the Omicron wave overloads capacity of a fragile health system. 
Dr. Kirk Maggie, the chief of the Central Zone Network of Emergency Departments, says each day since Christmas has gotten worse, and it's now the hardest it's been in his 22 years. Dr. Maggie says the heart of the problem is a shortage of staff in hospitals due to COVID infections. About 600 out of 22,000 health staff in the province are off the job because they have contracted COVID-19 or have been exposed to it. Trans Alta Renewables is going to have to replace all 50 turbine foundations at its Kent Hills 1 and 2 wind farm in New Brunswick. A tower collapsed there last year, and the company has determined deficiencies in the original design caused cracks in the foundations that require them to be replaced. TransAlta estimates the job will cost between $75 and $100 million, and that it will lose about $3.4 million in revenue per month as long as all 50 wind turbines are offline. Want to test your driving skills on ice? The Saskatchewan Safety Council is launching their 2022 Skid Smart Collision Avoidance Program at the Fleet Centre in Regina, where they will have a closed ice course. Traffic safety specialist Al Gall says the program is designed to let people see their vehicles handle in a typical Saskatchewan winter with icy and slippery conditions. The program is offered in the months of January and February, and anyone with a driver's license is eligible to take part. All right, stay tuned. We'll be back after the break with news from around the world. The World Economic Forum says the new space race and cybersecurity are threats to the global economy, and the World Bank downgrades its global economic outlook, while the U.S. Justice Department is establishing a domestic terrorism unit. These stories and more up next. The World Economic Forum says cyber threats and the growing space race are emerging risks to the global economy. That's on top of the existing challenges posed by climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. The Global Risks report released today says cyber attacks are becoming more aggressive and widespread as criminals use tougher tactics to go after more vulnerable targets. It also says space exploitation is a growing area of concern with little governance and plenty of opportunity for conflict. The World Bank is downgrading its outlook for the global economy and is forecasting growth of 4.1 percent this year, which is down from the previous estimate of 4.3 percent. It's blaming continuing outbreaks of COVID-19, a reduction in government economic support, and ongoing bottlenecks in global supply chains. Last year's strong recovery has resulted in the highest global inflation rates since 2008. This is prompting some central banks to consider raising interest rates to combat higher prices. Well, it looks like a third Chinese city has locked down its residents because of a COVID-19 outbreak. About 20 million people are now confined to their homes in China. This with three weeks to go before the Winter Olympics open in Beijing. It wasn't clear how long the lockdown of Anyang City might last, but mass testing is underway. Another 13 million people are locked down in Xi'an and 1.1 million in Yuzhou. The European Parliament says its president has died. A spokesman for President David Sassoli tweeted he died early Tuesday at a hospital in northeastern Italy at the age of 65. He'd been struggling for months with poor health and had been hospitalized since December 26th due to abnormal functioning of his immune system. The Italian journalist and socialist worked his way up in politics and was elected to the France-based European Parliament in 2009 and became its president in 2019. Well, in response to what it calls an elevated threat from violent extremists in the U.S., the Justice Department is establishing a specialized unit focused on domestic terrorism. Assistant Attorney General Matthew Olson told the Senate Judiciary Committee this morning that the number of FBI investigations into suspected domestic violent extremists has more than doubled since the spring of 2020. He says there is a growing threat from people motivated by racism and those who support extremist anti-government and anti-authority ideologies. A man accused of setting a fire that destroyed parts of South Africa's historic parliament complex is facing an additional charge of terrorism. State broadcaster SABC says the terrorism charge was added on Tuesday when the man appeared in court for a bail hearing. Zandile Mafe was already charged with housebreaking with intent to steal, theft, arson and possession of an explosive device. 
The parliament complex was ravaged by the fire that started January 2nd, and firefighters took four days to completely extinguish it. The president of Kazakhstan has announced that a Russia-led security alliance will start pulling out its troops from the Central Asian country in two days after completing its mission. The mostly Russian troops were deployed to Kazakhstan last week by the Collective Security Treaty Organization, an alliance of six former Soviet states. This was at the president's request amid unprecedented public unrest over soaring fuel prices that began on January 2nd. President Kasim Yomar Tokayev has blamed the unrest on foreign-backed terrorists. He said Tuesday that the CSTO will start withdrawing its troops in two days and the process will take no longer than 10 days. Local authorities say an Ethiopian drone strike has killed 17 civilians in the country's Tigray region. This was on the day that President Joe Biden, during a call with Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, expressed concern about such attacks in the ongoing war. A report by the Zonal Administration says women at a flour grinding mill made up most of those killed in the Monday drone strike. Such drone strikes have been reported almost daily in Tigray after Tigray forces retreated into their region and Ethiopian forces said they would not advance further there. In a medical first, doctors transplanted a pig heart into a patient in a last-ditch effort to save his life. It is too soon to know if the operation will work, but the fact that it was even tried marks a step in the decades-long quest to use animal organs for life-saving transplants. Doctors at the University of Maryland Medical Center say the transplant shows a heart from a genetically modified animal can work in the human body without immediate rejection. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. Remember, for more news on demand, you could always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, and make sure to follow us on social media. We're available on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Take care, Canada. We'll see you next time on the Forum Daily News.